This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Hello and welcome to the 40th episode of Seoul's 2022 Year of the Ecological Garden webinar series. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Christine and I'm the Special Projects Lead with Seoul. I live in Ottawa, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. For today's presentation, I'm pleased to introduce, and probably no introduction is necessary, Seoul's Executive Director, Sandora Elford Purvis, who is also a Seoul accredited organic land care practitioner. Sandora's presentation will be approximately 20 minutes, and then there'll be time for question and answers. As today's host, I will moderate the questions, but if anyone joining us live for today's presentation, feel free to put questions in the chat or else following the presentation, you can unmute and ask your questions directly. Finally, I'd like to mention before we begin that this webinar series and much of Seoul's work is made possible by the generous and ongoing support of Gaia College, Canada's leading college for professional development and diploma courses in organic land care. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to you, Sandora. Thank you. And I'm just gonna start a screen share or so everybody can see pretty pictures while I talk, because just looking at me is just not uh, not all that exciting. Uh, so da, 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 screen two, yes. Share. And is native plants for vegetable garden and herb and forest garden showing up on everyone's screen now? I'm seeing a thumbs up. There we go. All right, let me just pull that off to the side. Uh, actually, no, let me minimize that so it's not on anyone's screen. So native plants for the vegetable, herb, and forest garden. Um, I'm going to start off by mentioning I'll include links and botanical names of the plants and the species that I'm going to mention um, through this when it goes up on the Souls website later this week. So you don't have to freak out about, I missed what she said as I flew by things. Um, the other note I'd like to make is that I am speaking from Ottawa, Ontario, and where I live and work on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. And uh, where I live does somewhat influence some of the specific plants I'll mention, but some of the things I'll talk about are sort of useful continent-wide, or hopefully useful, helpful. Um, so starting with the spring, um, we'll talk about plants that uh, will support pollinators for your garden while also helping feed everyone. Um, one of the questions uh, I always like to bring up when planning on anything to do with food gardens, uh, especially perennial ones, is does your garden require early spring pollination? Um, most berries and fruiting trees and shrubs do re rely on the early rising species. Um, and the majority of spring nectar and pollen sources are actually trees. This is a question that comes up sometimes when people are talking about, oh, how do I support all the pollinators? Um, you really want to make sure that there's actually trees in the area. In most cases, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure on in prairie ecosystems what the first pollinator feeders are, but I'm sure there are some. But through anywhere where there's extensive forest cover, um, Trees are the source of a lot of the spring food. Um, silver maple, which is what is pictured, is among the very first here where I live. Uh, but willows of many different species offer up an abundance of pollen as well as nectar at the same time. And oaks and some of the other nut trees uh, bloom not that much later. So do a lot of poplar species. Um, and these are followed by then a lot of the fruit bearing trees and shrubs. Um, one of the very earliest blooming ones around here that's gotten a lot of popularity lately for people trying it is papa, which is um, the largest um, fruit native to North America. Um, a lot of people are working on expanding their range north, and so some of those you actually do need to get in there and hand pollinate um, because just not enough of the right kind of pollinators are up first thing in the spring. Um, so sometimes if we're expanding range a little bit uh, beyond a really historic range, it takes a little while for the pollinators to catch up with our moving of the plants. Um, 
Right after that, uh, you'll see the plums that the first of the showy sort of white blossoms to appear in the hedgerows here in eastern Ontario. And then the service berries are really near second. And both of those offer incredible amounts of fruit later in the season. In the good year, they will fluctuate, um, which is perfectly normal. But uh, yeah, the native plum species and the native service berry species, and that will vary area to area, which of those are native to your specific region. Um, but they are extended native to North America. Um, native cherries aren't much later um, here in this area, thicket or choke cherries, um, but are sort of more the shrub end of the spectrum, but there's also lots of um, like black cherry, large cherry trees. Um, they're hugely populate, popular with spring pollinators, um, and then they're also popular with birds later. Um, the choke cherries tend to be closer to the ground and often fruit in abundance, so you can gather a lot of those for human consumption as well. And they are also um, host species trees for a lot of leaf feeding species. So the, the moths and the butterflies when they're in the caterpillar stage, which is what a lot of songbirds feed their chicks. So they are native plants that feed humans, feed pollinators, feed birds, feed, feed uh, a lot of species. Um, so the cherry family and any of the prunus are quite good at that, the plums and cherries, the stone fruit. Berries, uh, another abundant source of food for an awful lot of the ecosystem. Um, most currants and go gooseberries, they bloom in mid spring. So again, they start the season off by feeding the pollinators. Um, and as with the raspberry and the plum families, some you'll find grown for fruit are species that are from other parts of the world rather than from North America. There can be various reasons for planting from um, the native or the introduced ones, so, but so you may end up wanting to include European and Asian cultivars in your food gardens. But if you are specifically looking for um, native species, do you take the time to double check the historical range of specific species you are seeking or planting? I just got to notice that my internet's slow. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, so it, there are a lot of cultivars that are from other continents. You may want those in your garden because some of them have been selected for a long time for fruit quality or, or other features. But for native species, take that time to double check the historical range um, to make if you are trying to specifically plant for native species, because you will find plums and raspberries and current family and so forth that they they have. The families have very wide ranges, but there are specific species that are native to different regions, including the ones specific to North America and the East and the West and so forth. Um, there's lots of native grapes um, and grapevine flowers absolutely buzz with pollinators in the late spring. I've had people sort of very surprised with that before. They're like, there's all these things on my mind. It's like they're literally the pollinators. Um, and uh, so they feed the pollinators in the spring and then they have lots of fruit that you can race the other critters for later on in the summer. Um, they'll often have, you'll often have a bit of competition for the fruit. Um, depending on your region and your soils, you also might be able to grow blueberries, cranberries, and there's other members of that overall family that are quite adapted to PT acidic soils, which make up an awful lot of Canadian soils. Um, when you get into any region that has the really rocky um, granite Canada Shield underneath, um, or that has to, tends to have bogs of any form. Nuts. Um, when you're thinking about your food systems and native plants, don't overlook the nut trees and shrubs. Um, they are among the most calorie dense crops once they mature. Um, black walnut, butternut, hickory, pecan, hazel are all native to this continent. And there's many oak acorns that become, can become nutrient dense flower if they're ground and leached to tannins. They have historically been a staple crop for, for many people. And uh, that was somewhat not lost, but reduced for a while. And now there's there's getting to be a rebound and in interest in that because they are such a sustainable, dense, uh, calorie dense food crop. Um, and also oaks are another species, another family that are 
hugely capable of feeding just an incredible array of, uh, of insects, including the moth, uh, the caterpillars of, of moths and butterflies that then again feed all the birds. Um, if you are planting your gardens, uh, including species that are from this continent, but with ranges that may not historically extend above the, the medicine line, that Canada-US border, um, American persimmon and pecan are two species that I'd, I would suggest looking into from slightly warmer regions. Um, there's some that are being selected for nor more northern ranges. Um, and personally, they're, they're my consolation species for the predicted shift in summer conditions the next couple of years in my area, or next couple of decades, I should say, in my area, because those warmer and longer summers will likely cause decline of birch and white pine in the places where I'm working. And I'm like, darn it, if I'm going to lose the birch and the white pine, I at least want pecans and persimmons out of the deal. <laughs> So they're a little bit of a constellation species, but they are species nord native to North America and not that far south of where, where I am already. Um, while all that pollination is going on, especially up in the trees and the woody plants, um, helping to ensure lots of abundance for later in the season, some of the plants that will offer pollen and nectar uh, later in the season, or leaves in the case of the host species, those ones are also offering spring greens to the rest of us. So there's a couple of species of nettles that are native to North America. Um, there's the fiddlehead ferns, like the ostrich ferns, alliums. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the um, wild leeks with their wide leaves and then they're very controversial harvesting because they're very very slow to regenerate in the woodland settings um, but there's also like nodding onion which is a hugely widely distributed species that is much faster to propagate and comes up just as early in the spring and is actually more of a meadow species so it's easy to incorporate into flower gardens into sort of ornamental patches into herb gardens um, and they're much easier to grow from seed so um, explore your alliums. It doesn't just have to be those wild leeks. There are other alliums which are much less threatened by harvesting and over harvesting. Um, there's cow parsnip, which is really early green, not to be mistaken for there's quite a few other species. So if you're looking at cow that they're often confused with, if you're looking at cow parsnip, definitely look up how to identify cow parsnip, but they have big abundant leaves and lots of good thick stems so you can harvest uh, quite a, a bulk for the, for the early in the spring. Canada honeywort, which is what's pictured, um, is, some, is related to um, Mitsuba, which some people might know as a Japanese herb. Um, they both, if you harvest them quite early in the spring, they are quite flavorful. They're kind of in the celery parsley end of the, world, uh, the flavor spectrum, and you can get a lot, you can get them while they're quite young, and the, the flavoring isn't overwhelming, but I actually also gather seeds from these at the end of the season and it has a really strong celery flavor and you can use them as seasoning or grind them and add them to, to breads or treat them all like you would a fennel seed in cooking. So um, abundant herb for the native plant garden at the start of the season and later on. Um, Ohio spider wart. Um, apparently all of the spider warts are edible greens in the spring, but I know for sure Ohio spider wart is. Lansleaf rebeccia, so the one that gets really tall and blooms, uh, they're sometimes called green-headed coneflower because they don't have the dark center that a lot of the black-eyed Susan family has. Um, they have really lush leaves in the spring and you can harvest them for a cooked green. Um, common milkweed shoots as they come up, uh, biennial evening primrose, the common one that have the rosettes, those rosettes of foliage are edible. Um, and that's just a few of the edible native spring greens that you can include in the garden. Um, there's a few more woody species that are still blooming sort of at that spring point and starting to come into summer and some are just starting to get going. Um, that includes the black elderberries, um, which have edible flowers, and they have abundant berries later on in the, in the growing season. And uh, they're ones that are both for a uh, juice as an edible, um, and also they're, um, they've gained a lot of attention as a, as a medicinal. They're actually recognized as being antiviral. Um, and, and 
as a medicine that, and which is why you're seeing a lot of extracts and that promoted because they went and they did some research. They went, oh, all that, all that folk medicine around elderberries, turns out it was accurate. Um, and they tend to produce in really huge abundance and um, are very fast growing as plants. So they mature quite quickly, uh, just a few years before the, the, they're covered in berries. Um, black raspberries are Rubus occidentalis. Um, they are a clump forming raspberry. That's what's pictured here. So it's a big plant, but possibly still better suited to small spaces than the red raspberries, which are always running. Um, what these do is they root where the branches touch the ground. So they arch up and they, they touch the ground and then that will root. So you can guide where you want a patch to spread if you want it to spread, or you can just clip them off when they start to root where you don't want them to. Um, they will keep coming up with new shoots from the center. So you, if you just want a patch of raspberries, you might want to try the black raspberries um, instead of having a huge raspberry thicket. Um, Tilia americana, which is um, the native linden, also called basswood, they have edible flowers, they, which is, are sometimes used as a tea, that's linden tea. Um, their spring leaves are soft and can be used um, as a raw green and for wraps, uh, as well as as a cooked green. And uh, in a video that I recently saw by Alexis Nicole, who goes by Black Forager on various social media, um, apparently the seed pods, if you roast them, just in a pen and grind them up, they taste like chocolate. So I did not have a chance to try this this year, but I am totally going to track down some seed pods of those next year um, because it would be awesome to have a locally native party chocolate alternative. Um, there's also many species of hardy roses on this continent, which offer both beautiful blooms and vitamin C rich fruit later on in the season. Um, there's native spireas, uh, including the very adaptable alba or like the white spirea. Um, and they attract, not only do they feed a lot of uh, pollinator service providers, um, they also attract actually a lot of predatory wasps, which will, while they're around, Get, eat the critters that eat your garden. So another good native plant to have near your, your food garden because they can help take some of the pressure off of the plants from all the other critters, critters who want to eat your plants. Um, the herbaceous species that support pollinators are also in full abundance by late spring and early summer. Um, strawberries will have been in bloom for a while and the first fruits will be ripening fairly soon into the season. Um, they, they are the first berry, um, uh, traditionally, in a, in a lot of Indigenous traditions. I know we've been introduced to some earlier fruiting species, but of the, of the Indigenous berries, strawberries are known as, as the first berry. Um, in addition to offering flowers and those tiny flavor-packed berries, um, the, the pretty generous plants, they also fill in the ground cover layer in a lot of perennial ecosystems. So you can plant them in amongst other plants that you may need to access through the season. So you have to be able to walk over someone or something. So the strawberries can form that ground cover layer. And they do thrive alongside the lance leaf self heal, which is the plant that's pictured, um, which is also, or they are a member of the mint family and they are also a foot traffic tolerant species. Um, so they are a food source for a lot of tiny pollinators, and I'll come back to mint, mint family around about that. Um, and they are also a medicinal herb uh, with a long history of use in many cultures because there is a European species and then there is the North American species and trait wise they are very similar. They are distinct species but very similar and they have the history of medicinal um, applications um, around the Northern Hemisphere. Um, common milkweed flower buds are an early summer vegetable, um, so you can pick them at the, the flower bud stage. Um, they can help justify to some people who might be a little bit hesitant about this very um, rambunctious plant in a vegetable garden um, about, as a reason to include them in the vegetable garden. Um, and they are, while they're there, they can go about their really important ecological work of supporting a lot of species, not just the monarch butterfly, but there are actually lots of species that rely on milkweed. Um, and also the tender pods of the milkweed later in the summer. I know from experience, they grill up 
quite beautifully. And apparently they're also quite good battered and then fried like wings, like like you know, chicken wings, but like with, with milkweed pots instead. Trick is to get them young before that silk gets fibrous. Um, the pollen providers. So uh, the early emerging pollinators, over the, they overwinter in the leaf litter and in tunnels and in wood and in the soil. And they do need us to leave the messy bits in place because that's where they live. Um, and many of them also do need pollen and nectar sources through the summer to raise their babies that will become next year's adults. So to get that spring pollination, we need habitat and we also need later summer foods. Um, so to keep the pollinators well fed through the summer and the fall, um, as those woody plant blooms start to fade away, we can work with the keystone herbaceous species for your region. These will tend to include many members of the Asteraceae family, which is a huge and, and notably includes asters, right? But also goldenrod, sunflowers, and mo if it looks like a daisy flower, it's even if you have to look up really up close to see that, it's probably a member of Asteraceae. Um, I will include a link to the um, the Keystone Native Species maps. Um, it's from the uh, National Wildlife Federation. It is U.S., but happily they extend into Canada, and they have lists, so you can find your your eco region and then find the lists of the Keystone species for that that we've identified so far. We still don't know everything about how our ecosystems that we are living in how they all work. Um, a group of plants that don't have that same degree of specific species relationships, so they don't end up on the keystone species list the way Astraceae does and a few others, um, but these do offer a great deal of generalist support to pollinators. It's the mint family, which includes the bee balms and the mountain mints and pretty much any of the ones that smell like mint. <laughs> um, and there, it, it's a, it is a huge family. It's maybe not quite as big as Astracia, but it's, it's, it's a, it holds its own. And quite a few members of uh, the, the, our conventional herb garden, um, which do include a lot of plants that come from other continents, but a lot of those are members of the mint family. And you can see if you watch them in the bloom stage, just how popular they are with pollinators. Um, and that's because they're the nectar providers. They feed the adult phase for them because a lot of those pollen a lot of pollen gathering that the bees do, they do that to provide um, food for the larval stage. And, but the adults themselves, they actually feed on the nectar. Um, so to keep that in mind that you need to feed the adults and the babies. So lots of pollen for, for raising babies, but to having some plants that specifically provide nectar will also ensure that the adult stage is well fed. Um, Another group of plants that can be really important to space is where we hope for enough abundance so that we can feed ourselves along with the rest of the ecosystem um, are as those that host nitrogen fixing bacteria. And I tend to call them nitrogen fixing plants, but yes, it is the bacteria that actually does the work of fixing the nitrogen in exchange for sugars from the plants. Um, and with the popularity of a lot of permaculture books and teachers that have their roots on other continents, quite a few of the plants that have been popularized, um, of like nitrogen fixing plants that have been popularized, um, with, that are perfectly appropriate for those ecosystems where a lot of the advice originated, are running the risk of, or are already becoming invasive species here. Um, happily, there are plenty of nitrogen fixing native species on this continent that are native to this continent. Um, and a lot of them are also popular with pollinators. Um, these uh, wild senna that I've got at my place, they um, they don't produce nectar, but they're, they provide lots of pollen and they're generally quite quite popular with the pollinators in the summer. Um, I will include a link to a list, it's a text form, didn't look very pretty for posting on here, of nitrogen fixing native species that I compiled from a bit of online research a couple of years ago. Um, I'll post a link to that when I post this video on the Seoul website and uh, also to another uh, resource, which is an Ontario specific one, but uh, has some lovely, perfectly garden adapted species. 
Um, so the herbaceous keystone species. Uh, while the trees fill that hunger gap for the very early emerging pollinators, that start of the season, asters and goldenrod fill the end of the season where I live and in many of the temperate parts of this continent. While goldenrod are often lumped into a single category by people, not, not by like biologists, but by the general driving down the road looking at all the goldenrods, um, once you start to explore a bit more closely, you'll find that there's a lot of different goldenrod species, and there's one for just about any setting, from the rock garden to the wetland. Um, from those hugely exuberant species that will fill all available space, Canada goldenrod, and feed incredible uh, numbers of pollinators all by themselves, to small, conforming species that can tolerate growing in that strip of compacted dry earth between the sidewalk and the street gray stem or, or old field goldenrod, or to the airy, lacy forest dwellers that can thrive in the shade under pine trees, blue stem goldenrod. Um, so they're hugely adaptable and they, or they're, they're I should say adaptable. They, there are many of them that are perfectly adapted to a wide range of growing conditions, um, including conditions that we actually find quite challenging. So they can be problem solver plants just in the, I can't get anything to grow here. There might be a goldenrod for that. Um, asters are equally diverse in their, their needs and their natures and far more diverse in color. So a whole range of the pinks, purples, bluish tones, whites, um, and a lot of them actually change color a bit through their life cycle. Um, neither of these, neither the asters nor the, nor the goldenrod, is the cause of hay fever since the pollen is too sticky to float on the air. Um, that distinction belongs to the also native ambrosia species, ragweed. Their botanical name really is ambrosia. Um, and those are wind pollinated. They do also have a place in the ecosystem since actually a lot of pollen feeding species will go and gather pollen from them since they have no shortage of pollen. Since they're wind pollinated and their seeds feed small birds in the winter time. But we may want to keep those out of our garden areas to spare people who are who react to the pollen um, that does end up floating in the air around them. So grow the asters and goldenrod and, and leave, leave the ragweed. So, um, I see we have some feedback happening. The Zoom user. Ah, uh, there we go, perfect. Um, the sunflower family is another one that feeds in abundance of pollinators. They do this while also feeding the birds, the humans, and many other species. In addition to the seeds of the Heliathus annulus, that common annual sunflower, um, the perennial tuberosus sunflower, which goes by a lot of different common names, um, the misnomer Jerusalem artichoke, um, the adaptation sunchoke, which has had some pushback, and I most often use sun root because it's descriptive. They are a sunflower that grows a big root. Um, these obviously they offer an abundance of root rather than seeds. Um, and in addition to their colorful flowers, they are famous for two things, spreading at a rate that can overwhelm small spaces and causing very gassy gastrointestinal reactions and many of the people who consume them because of the inulin they have. Um, I have found that they don't compete well in dense established perennial meadow ecosystems, but if you don't have one of those to surround these with or are in an urban or suburban setting, you might want to grow these in the container to handle that sort of first challenge. For the second challenge, um, black dough fermentation and uh, or cooking with high acid uh, ingredients like lemon juice have both been reported to break down the inulin that's the cause of the digestive stress for a lot of people. But my personal favorite method is slow cooking. After about 12 hours on low in a slow cooker, that inulin converts over to sugars that are easily digestible. They come out so sweet that I have actually dehydrated those resulting uh, slow cooked roots um, and eaten them like candy. I've also pureed them and added them to baked goods as a natural sweetener. Um, a chocolate tart that was a particular success, and at some time I'd love to make it with those uh, those linden seeds. Um, I, I'll share the rest of the link to the recipe in the post I did about that, about uh, how I prepared the roots, and then and then the the chocolate tart recipe as well. So I'll share that when I post this. Um, 
So there's an incredible abundance of native species that have much to offer the herb, vegetable, and forest garden. They vary with region and with growing conditions and often have different cultural and care requirements than the conventional annual vegetable garden that many of us learned to garden in. To get started on edible native plant gardening, first thing is find your ecoregion or ecozone. Um, I will share a link to the map that I'm showing here that will help you identify which zone you're in um, so that you can then start to narrow down which species are appropriate for your area uh, because there's so many different ecosystems. Um, you wanna find out where you are, ecologically speaking, as opposed to necessarily border speaking. Um, and then another thing I would recommend is find an indigenous authored book about plants in your region. So whether you're boreal or Eastern, Central, Prairie, West Coast, et cetera. Um, and there are books on all those regions about native plants written by indigenous authors now available. Um, there are two indigenous online bookstores that I know of, and there's probably more, but the goodminds.com is located here in Ontario and Strong Nations is in BC. And they both have extensive lists of the books um, that could be very helpful while you're learning about place. Not every book that they offer is Indigenous authored, so do read through the descriptions because they will tell you, but they do a lot of work to track down and curate their offerings. Um, once you find the book, read it, not just for a plant list, but to start to get a feel for the nature of the relationships and the ecosystem you're working with. I also recommend finding a field guide to edible plants of your region, um, like the wild edible plants of your region, and look for it to learn more about the species that are already in your area. Some you might just be able to wild harvest, um, and some you might want to specifically add to a space you're tending. Um, next, check your bioregion map for the recommended keystone species for your area. And again, I will post links um, to some of those maps. Um, look for overlap in the lists of the edible species and the keystone species, and then put those as your priority plants on, on your planning. Um, if they fit with the space you're working with, obviously not everybody can fit an oak tree in the backyard, but do your best. Uh, with, with what you have to work with. And um, also when you're putting together your list, do keep in mind that a lot of native species are specialists rather than generalists and their growing requirements, including their relationships with nearby species. They're just that, they're requirements and they can't adapt to, and they can't all adapt to garden settings. Quite a few can, but not all can. So, so read a bit about what their needs are. Um, first, and then if they're just not suited to your space, that's fine. Not every space is suited to every plant. Do double check with VASCAD, the Vascular Plants of Canada database, which is that screenshot I'm showing you right now, um, to confirm the native space status of the species on your list. So it is only by province, but it's a good sort of double check because it's um, a very well uh, updated and current site that has actually disambiguated some things and some things that were presumed to be native aren't and then some things that were presumed to be introduced have been confirmed now to be native so it's it's very up it's a very up-to-date resource it's it's constantly updated um, you can also use their list builder tool to find out which species of a genus are native to your province and it's useful for things like we see a recommendation of oak native to your region or goldenrod native to your region on the keystone species lists. And I will post a link to a video on how to use both that name search and, and the list builder tool um, on Bascan. Do plan for all the seasons whenever possible. So work through the seasons, making a list of which species will feed the pollinators and the other non-human life and will feed you and other human life. Um, from spring through fall and then into the winter, including the late hanging fruit and seeds for non-humans and storage foods, uh, including nuts, seeds and roots for humans. So if you're planning a food garden, don't forget winter. And finally, keep the ecosystem type for each of your areas in mind. High disturbance species, 
These are ones that thrive in conventional vegetable garden settings, including annuals of all types, most biennials, and some of the plants cultivated for roots, including those, those tuber sunflowers, the sunroots, um, by any of their names. Then low disturbance species that include trees, shrubs, and most long-lived perennial plants. You don't wanna put those in the same spot. Make spaces that are a little bit separated um, or they're next to each other, but they're not too intermingled so that you don't have to be constantly causing disturbance in those ecosystems that actually do require quite a bit of time to mature. Um, keep in mind the access you'll need for harvest. Berry bushes and most fruit trees will need to be accessed from all sides. Nuts are usually gathered from the ground, so the plant layer there needs to be low or trimmable um, shortly before nut drop season if you want to be able to actually gather the nuts. Um, plan for your messy spaces. Habitat is a must for a healthy ecosystem. Everyone needs a space to live. You need uh, you need a bit of that dead wood and the decomposing layer um, and the stems and that for, for, for the full life cycles of, of all the creatures that rely on that space and provide you with the, a whole bunch of services you need, including pollination. Um, where plan for your decomposition. Chop and drop is great for the majority of material, just cutting things down and, and dropping it down to the ground in perennial ecosystems and even in a lot of annual ones, you can do that. Uh, but a dedicated compost space can be helpful, especially if you'd be processing a lot of harvest and have bits like skin, seeds, stems, or pulp that you can return to that ecosystem because sustainable landscape feeds everyone, including the microbes and the fungi. Um, as time goes on, make small adjustments, watch what happens, who shows up, who leaves, who thrives, and adjust your plans court accordingly. Repeat indefinitely, and you'll eventually find yourself in relationship with your local ecosystem. So, I want to- Well, Sandora, that was uh, an incredible overview. And what I find so fascinating is, it sounded like it was gonna be a gardening webinar, but so much of what you're talking about is ecosystem thinking and understanding ecology. And so I just want to ask for you, when did that happen for you that you were very conscious of not only gardening in isolation for whatever edibles that you were gardening for, but when you started to consider the, the wider impact that the gardening had and how you wanted to support other species as well? When did that come to you or has it always been with you? Uh, it's definitely evolved over time and I was just looking around at the books downstairs on my uh, coffee table, not upstairs on my desk. I knew it was around somewhere, but I'm like, where was it? It's the, uh, I was getting quite uncomfortable with the ecological costs that I was really starting to see in the work I was doing in conventional horticulture and gardening. And uh, I was starting to sort of go, how can we do this sustainably? And there are some inherently unsustainable things about how the horticulture we're taught works um, for a lot of us as we get into it. And I came across a book called um, Plants Have So Much to Give Us, All We Have to Do is Ask. And it's by Mary Sisip Genius and it's um, Anishinaabe Botanical Teachings is sort of the subtitle. And she told the stories of plants as living beings in relationship while also providing really solid like scientifically western science based information about plants and, and, and about the species she was, she was um, telling the stories of and the perspective that was built into that I went at the time I couldn't even quite explain what it was, but it, it really is a different relationship. And that's why you keep hearing me say things like relationship, because it was about being in relationship with the ecosystem, as opposed to in control of the garden. And it, it was just such a different perspective uh, from what I was, what, what informed so much, so much of that the garden relationship. So there's also so many more plants. <laughs> 
this is another thing that I sort of, as a plant geek, realized over time is when you start gardening with native plants, there's so many more. It's not just some new cultivar, a new color. There's always more plants to learn. There's so many plants and, and the list, the, the species diversity we work with in, in conventional gardening versus when we start to try to draw on the native species. It's just so different. We're like working with like five or ten percent of what is possible, and it's just like, oh, yeah. there's so many. I need, I need to find about all of them, and and then and then where can I get seeds? Um, yes. So there's a real, there's a lot of delight in it as well. Um, well, you you do you show a lot of delight whenever you're speaking about this. But one one thing I, you're so helpful in terms of now that you talked about the resources and how you can cross reference different um, resources that you have for native species for edible species, keystone species. Um, the first time I heard trees fill the hunger gap in the spring and herbaceous plants fill the hunger gap in the fall. Um, you're also talking seasonally as well, the, the considerations that you make. Um, one thing that I, I'd be interested in, and if anybody has another question, please put it in the chat. Someone has to leave, I think, but there's a, a comment. Um, but the question I have is, what do you do to document the work because your delight also comes from observation it comes from recording it comes from sharing your knowledge and what do you do in practice for for documenting and reflecting on the work that you do or the efforts that you make Okay. So this is my documentation tool and it looks fancy but it, it literally it's like eight years old um, I take lots of photos and photos for me make me stop. And I take a lot of close up photos, although I've been getting better by taking further back photos because people are like, but what does it look like in the garden? <laughs> I'm like, but look at this flower and look at the critter on it. And so looking closely um, and taking lots of photos. And then I usually over the winter work on organizing the photos and adding names and stuff. And last winter I did post on social media uh, photos and a sort of bio of one on native to Ontario plant species every day. I'm not gonna quit commit to quite that level of social media posting next, uh, next winter, but I'll continue putting material together. So I take a lot of pictures. And then honestly, there's so many species to, to learn and sort of try to follow that I gather a lot of seeds to donate to the local wildflower seed library that works on, on gathering, packing, and distributing the seeds, um, which is a wonderful service that humans can provide to native plants. Um, and so I literally now have a spreadsheet of the species. So when I'm, I, I can pull it up on my phone and check and go, which ones haven't I gathered yet? Because it's easy to forget to check them <laughs> and go, oh, their seeds are ripe. I need to gather those now. So um, it's, there is a combination of working with just paying attention to them and and also of, of managing some of the information once I get the information because there's a lot and there's a lot of plants to know. Well, one other thing about information too, and you just spoke about the, well, the Ottawa wildflower seed um, seed collection library <laughs> yeah library sorry and that that was a, a webinar that we hosted a few weeks ago so people can go back to that and learn how they can do that in their community and also what you're speaking about information wise and and how how bringing in these species is somehow you're you're doing that you're managing that process and so um, it just reminds me of last week's conversation that we had with um someone from the Mohawk community here in Ontario who, is, who did speak about for thousands of years the management of nut trees that was extremely important not to take down other tree types um, but to encourage the nut species around where they were mostly doing agricultural practice that and strawberries were, were key to um, a lot of their plantings around where they live so we have lots of information to share on on these topics through this whole year's webinar series and being the 40th one, there's um, many others to check out on the website. Um, if, if no one else has a question, well, they have time right now before I wrap up because it is 345, but I just wanna say this is extremely useful and thank you very much for also committing to follow up with the resources um, that will be posted um, with this presentation. And I know, I, I think I can speak for everybody that you're just a wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm for this topic. And we really appreciate it. Thank you.
So um, stay tuned for more information about the upcoming um, episodes for this webinar series. And I also would like to make a plug for the Greener Green Spaces program. Uh, Seoul's recognition program launched last year and it recognizes sites across Canada that meet criteria to, to promote and support biodiversity and to also consider the, the footprint of the work that they do and also one sites that support plant and soil health. So it's a recognition program for green spaces in municipalities across Canada, small, large, and we invite you to please check out the website and and encourage you to apply for any sites that might meet this criteria. It's an excellent way to get the recognition for the work that you you do as a community group, as an organization or business um, to to really be part of that community of practice that's trying to make healthier ecosystems within our spaces so that we can enjoy them as well as other species and and help address and mitigate the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis in, in our world. So with that, I would like to wrap up and thanks Andorra and all of you again for participating today um, for this excellent presentation. Okay, thank you. Bye.